It's time to eat. What are you hungry for? Sit down and get ready to consume an abundance of fantasy football knowledge from Ross Tucker and Joe Dolan. Feed me now! I'm starving! On the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. Yeah, let's eat, baby. This is the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. We are, of course, presented by DraftKings. Love those dudes. Love all of you that check us out. We are year-round, of course, during the NFL regular season, two episodes a week to make sure you're ready and able to set your lineups. The rest of the week, the year, we are weekly, obviously, getting you ready for next year's fantasy football season, which will be here before you know it. This is how you separate yourself. This is how you differentiate yourself from your buddies, your friends, your colleagues, your family members, whoever. Plus, it's just a fun, different way to look at pro football. I am Ross Tucker, the former NFL offensive lineman, five teams, seven years. You can always check me out on social media, at Ross Tucker NFL. You can check out the show network handle, at Ross Tucker Pod, whether that's Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or whatever. You can always also watch the show. We're part of the DraftKings Network and YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. I say it every week because I mean it every week. The star of the show is Joe Dolan from FantasyPoints.com. Now is a great time to invest in yourself, to invest in fantasy football success, to invest in being more knowledgeable about the sport you clearly know and love. FantasyPoints.com, use the code 24FEAST, FantasyPoints.com, and follow him on social media, at FG underscore Dolan, he is the fantasy gangsta, and he's remained and has been for a long time one of the top ranked fantasy analysts in all of football. Joe, there's a lot to get to, we're going to have a fun couple weeks, right, like, Next week, we can talk about your season recap and what we learn takeaways that we need to really keep in mind going into next year for our drafts, whatever they are, right? Dynasty or best ball or season long, as well as diving into all of these coordinator decisions. I might ask you about a couple of the recent ones that have come down the pipe, but we're going to have a whole episode where we just talk about some of the coaching changes and what it means for different teams. But first, let's talk Super Bowl. And I'm curious, Joe, what some of your thoughts are, what some of your takeaways are from a fantasy perspective and really a football perspective coming out of that Super Bowl. I mean, look, Rossi, you you have the Rossi, you have 47 different podcasts and I'm sure every single one of them mentioned how great Patrick Mahomes is like I mean like it's it from a fantasy perspective Mahomes is actually kind of more interesting than from an NFL perspective at this point because from a fantasy perspective he wasn't all that good this year and of course we're grading Patrick Mahomes on a curve and then we know that both he and Travis Kelsey leveled up in the playoffs and Mahomes did an unbelievable job obviously on the final drive and then after playing a very kind of uh I guess you would say just mediocre to poor first half, including the interception. Um, And then managed to just take advantage of the fact that the 49ers just would not take the game. Mahomes was stellar. um, And the thing you still have to look at when it comes to the Chiefs is Travis Kelsey's a year older. And keep in mind that their wide receivers, Kansas City, were not very good this year. We talked about it all season long that their wide receivers were not good this year. And Patrick Mahomes, nonetheless, still ended up leading them to a title. Now, for next year, when you look at Patrick Mahomes and you look at the Chiefs, what are they going to do at wide receiver? Are they going to draft somebody? Are they going to go out and sign somebody? And we'll do more uh, in-depth fantasy uh, uh, free agency previews when we talk about some of the receivers who are going to hit the open market, some receivers who might not hit the open market. Maybe there's a trade out there. But Patrick Mahomes managed to to um, do this what w- in the Super Bowl with obviously Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey obviously had his his 93 receiving yards. But his top two wide receivers in this game, in terms of yardage, were Mecole Hardman and Justin Watson. 
I mean, come on. Like, and then last year, obviously, you know, Juju Smith-Schuster's out there and Sky Moore and Kadarius Toney and, and like, it, it Andy Reid and, and, like, likes to play on hard mode with receivers, and unlike Donovan McNabb in Philadelphia, he has a quarterback who can elevate that. I'm not saying Donovan McNabb wasn't great, but he was, he was not all-time great, and that's the difference between Andy Reid in, in Kansas City and Andy Reid in Philadelphia. Just a fantastic performance by Patrick Mahomes. Um, when it comes to the 49ers, Ross, uh, you know, uh, you had Greg Cosell on the Ross Tucker football podcast. And I know he said in the first two rounds of the playoffs, he did not think Brock Purdy played well. I thought Purdy handled himself pretty well in the Super Bowl. Um, they had a lot of free rushers. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you he played great, but he's also a young quarterback in his second season heading into his third. Um and I would be encouraged by that performance if I were a 49er fan. Um, you know, one of the bets that I actually really liked for the Super Bowl was Brock Purdy. It, it was it was significant plus money was over one and a half interceptions. And as as I mentioned, we had charted him with five turnover worthy throws at Fantasy Points Data in the first two rounds of the Super Bowl, and he just did not put the ball into harm's way in the Super Bowl. So um, I was relatively impressed by Brock Purdy. I'm not going to sit here and tell you there's a there's a talking head out there um, uh, who covers the 49ers uh, for a particular outlet who's like, oh my God, he's Joe Montana. I was like, first and foremost, that's unfair to Brock Purdy. And it's also ridiculous, okay? Like Joe Montana is one of the five greatest quarterbacks ever to step on the field. Um, but I thought Brock Purdy acquitted himself well in the Super Bowl. But now the 49ers, you know, we always talk about these Super Bowl hangovers and whatnot. I'm not sure how real they are. Um, the Eagles hangover didn't kick in until midway through the season when they had a gauntlet of opponents. But the 49ers are out here. You've got John Feliciano b b blaming his teammates for missing blocks. Um, you've got Brandon Ayuk's family saying, we're, oh, this is why we're not going to stay in San Francisco because why does your 1,500-yard uh, receiver or 1,300-yard receiver have only three catches in the Super Bowl? Um, Debo Samuel caught just three of 11 targets in that game. There's going to be, um, there's going to be some moves that the 49ers are going to have to make because eventually if they, if they truly believe Brock Purdy's the guy, they're going to have to pay the guy. Um, and then there's going to be some moves that they're going to have to make in, in the ancillary for that. Um, so the 49ers are to me, a more interesting team heading into next year, because when you reach the doorstep and you don't cross into the house, um, it's always a little bit tougher the next year. And um, they've got some personalities on this team. Let's let, let's put it that way. Um, it's going to be a really interesting offseason for Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch. Like, let's talk about Mahomes and Kelsey. Yeah. How did they finish the year in terms of QB what, tight end what? And what do you think that that means for next year? How high will you have them rank going into next year? Well, here's the thing with, with, with let's start with Mahomes. Um, you can never rank Mahomes low because obviously he's Patrick Mahomes. Um, when you when you take a look at his overall performance, he was clearly great. Uh, and then he got better in the playoffs. And I think that playoff performance, as it well should, is going to stick with people. Patrick Mahomes last year uh, in 2023 was the overall quarterback eight um, in, in fantasy points. And then in terms of fantasy points per game, among quarterbacks who started 10 or more games, he was actually the quarterback 10 in fantasy points per game. He was behind, um, obviously, guys like Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts and Lamar Jackson. But he was also behind Dak Prescott. He was behind Jordan Love. He was behind Brock Purdy. He was behind C.J. Stroud. He was behind Justin Fields. He was behind Justin Herbert in fantasy points per game among quarterbacks who started 10 or more games. If you include quarterbacks who didn't start 10 or more games, he was also behind Joe Flacco, Kirk Cousins, Kyler Murray, and Anthony Richardson. Patrick Mahomes was the quarterback 14 in fantasy points per game. That's not going to happen. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be ranking him quarterback one. Let's see what their offseason looks like. I don't know if I'm going to be ranking him quarterback two or three. You know, obviously because Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts are obviously still great. Lamar Jackson won the MVP award. He's fantastic for fantasy. Um, uh, Jordan Love is ascending. Kyler Murray, they're probably going to get him some weapons. But Patrick Mahomes is going to be off the board as one of the first five quarterbacks. It's hard to 
it's hard to not rank him among that given his greatness. And I do expect that the Chiefs are going to make at least one significant move at wide receiver. Now, the question becomes, does that offset because Travis Kelsey, maybe you anticipate taking a step back. Kelsey was still the tight end one in fantasy points per game this year, but not nearly by the margin that we're used to. As a matter of fact, there was no margin at all. He was actually tied with TJ Hawkinson at 14.7 PPR fantasy points per game, and then obviously Kelsey leveled up in the playoffs. Um, Hawkinson obviously is going to be coming off of an injury, but Sam Laporta is somebody who I had mentioned on this podcast earlier. I think you can make a real argument for him to be the tight end one next year. I expect Kelsey, presuming he comes back, to still be drafted as the tight end one, but he is no longer a first-round pick kind of kind of uh, uh, of player. He is a um, he is somebody who I think is going to end up in the second, third round, and he's going to be drafted near Mark Andrews. He's going to be drafted near Sam Laporta and some of these other tight ends. Kelsey's run as a first-round pick is over, but maybe that makes him a little bit more palatable in 2024. What about Pacheco, Joe? I mean, he's. I mean, obviously, none of the receivers are really part of it. Where I, I really don't even remember, to be honest with you, where Pacheco was getting drafted and where he should be getting drafted. Yeah. He was kind of like a seventh, eighth round pick this year, um, and he turned out to be a really good investment there. He turned out to be somebody who. Um, was able to not necessarily carry your fantasy team. I know he had a run late in the year where he was scoring touchdowns, but he was the RB 14 in fantasy points per game. He played in 14 games in, in, uh, in terms of total fantasy points, he was the RB 15. I think that's going to make him kind of a fourth, fifth round pick for fantasy. I think he's going to be a very popular kind of, um, if you don't draft a running back in the first three rounds, maybe you go with him and say, Hey, look, I I'll try to hit on, um, some dynamic players later. We know Pacheco's not dynamic. He's going to try to run through, you know, you know what he is. He's going to try to run through a brick wall. Um, and he's going to score touchdowns because the Chiefs score touchdowns. He's not going to catch a lot of passes, even though we did a little bit more of that this year. Um, he caught 44, but he had just, he just had just 5.5 yards per reception. It's not really a part of his game where you think of him as dynamic. I kind of liken him to like a Marshawn Lynch or an Adrian Peterson um, when they were in their primes where um, Pacheco's obviously not those guys, but when those guys were in their primes, um, if they caught three passes in a game, you took it and just understood um, that the rushing production was going to make up for the lack of receiving production. I think Pacheco is going to be one of those kind of boring low end RB one, high end RB two guys who might end up as the number one running back uh, on a team that doesn't take a running back in the first three or four rounds of draft. Whether you're hosting game day or movie night, Joe DiGiorno knows that planning a watch party on a budget isn't easy. You need the perfect setting, the perfect squad, the perfect eats. Luckily, you're a game time mastermind. And you know that grabbing DiGiorno classic crust pizza can bring home a dub because it's packed with half a pound of cheese, sauce, other toppings, comes at an incredible price. Make the game winning call and grab a DiGiorno classic crust pizza from the grocery store today. It's not delivery, it's DiGiorno. And it's Wednesday, which means for me, we're one day away from me drinking some Labatt Blue Lights with my friends and my family and living life to the power of we. Always enjoy it responsibly, of course. Beer, Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. Joe, let's dive a little bit deeper into the Niners on the other side. You made some really interesting points about Ayuk and what's going on there. I actually was on the radio this morning and the radio host predicted a season-ending injury for McCaffrey next year, just saying he's due mm. for one, which I don't know how you do that, but yeah, that's what yeah, he yeah. said. So take me through how some of these Niners players finished up and what you see from them next year. By the way, isn't Ayuk under contract for another year? Too? Yeah. Like, what um, are we even talking about? Yeah, so Ayuk was – um. He was the 2020 draft, I believe. Yeah, I think he was the uh, I think he was the 2020 draft, um, the COVID draft. So it would be his fifth year, the fifth year option coming. Now, does he come out and say trade me because you're not going to pay me because you've got to end up paying Brock Purdy? You've got to pay all these guys. I don't know. Um, there's always a lot of emotion 
when uh, when your season ends in the playoffs and especially it ends in the Super Bowl, especially if, if, if you feel like you should have been uh, better um, or better utilized in the game. But let, let's just say everybody's back for the 49ers. Christian McCaffrey, you know, the running back position is going to be really through the ringer next year. I told you in August this season that I thought it was the, the the fewest consensus running backs in the first round ever. And after what happened to some of the guys we took in the first round this year, um, B. John Robinson completely misutilized by Arthur Smith. was He was a first-round pick. Austin Eckler had one of the worst seasons in terms of injuries and expectations. You know, he was a bust of a first-round pick. Tony Pollard. I told you on this show a, a couple of months, maybe a month or so ago, that in terms of a guy who just didn't get hurt during the season, Tony Pollard might have been one of the biggest fantasy busts I'd ever seen. The offense was good, the utilization was good, and he and he still finished as the RB23 in fantasy points per game. Christian McCaffrey, as I sit here, is probably the only running back who I am like, dead 100% sure is going to carry a first-round ADP next year. Now, I can look at Kyron Williams and say Kyron Williams was fantastic, but Sean McVay, he loves these little flings, man. He has flings with running backs. We're like, you know, I don't want to get too too dirty here, but, like, you know, it's like everything's really good, and then he moves on to the next one, you know, like – uh He's he's a running back Iser, you know. He likes to he likes to wear <laughs> one out and then he likes to go to the next one, you know. So I don't know if like Kyron Williams right now is he going to be a first round pick? Alvin Kamara was actually the RB three in fantasy points per game. Uh, I'm not drafting him in the first round. The RB four and the RB five in fantasy points per game were Raheem Mostert and Devon Achan. Are those guys going in the first round? I don't think so. You know, I think the guy who probably has the best chance to be a first round pick. Uh, outside of Christian McCaffrey, is Brees Hall. So Christian McCaffrey, if you are a militant running back in the first round kind of guy, well, you better get one of the first two or three picks to draft Christian McCaffrey because I'm not sure who else you're going to feel really good about drafting in the first round at that position this year. Ooh, that that is very interesting. Um, Will you be affected at all by what you saw in the Super Bowl before it for Kittle, Purdy, Debo? Uh I'm I'm not in the George Kittle business anymore, Ross. I, I mean, I think George Kittle is a team player. There's no doubt about it. But he has way too many games where he just disappears. Um, and if I'm a DFS player and our wonderful data team at Fantasy Points Data tells me this is the kind of coverage that George Kittle eats up, this is the kind of matchup where I think Kyle Shanahan's going to really utilize George Kittle, then I'll use him in DFS. For season long, I'm not in that business anymore. He disappears way too often for, for t- where he typically gets drafted, and uh, I'll, I'll try to get a more consistent option. Let's move on, Joe, to some of these coaching changes. For sure. Which I think are interesting. I guess the first one I wanted to ask you about. Mm -hmm. This is really tough. It's the most recent one. And it's Ryan Grubb with the Seattle Seahawks. And so, I know you probably haven't done... I'm, I'm not asking you to, like, do a deep dive into what he did at Washington, obviously, in college football. I guess the question is... For a guy that comes from college and has no pro track record, what do you do? I mean, do you, do you take what he did at Washington with Penix and those receivers and think that's what he'll do in Seattle? Or do you think he might I mean, change? I mean, I guess, I guess we kind of go, got to go off of what he did last year with Washington, right? So the thing about Seattle, though, is you look at the fact that you have Metcalf and Lockett and Smith and Jigba, and you're like, Wow. He can really air it out, but Lockett's older. You know, Metcalf had some injury problems. I think Smith and Jigba had a fine rookie season. Um, He wasn't great, um, but maybe that's just because he wasn't playing the snaps that maybe he wanted to play. But then you also look at Seattle and realize, you know, he's got two young offensive tackles, you know, with Cross and Lucas, and you have Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet in the backfield. So he can kind of meld this offense staff however he wants to. He can – this is a – this is a – 
This is a ball of wax right now. He can do whatever he wants with this. And then, of course, Mike McDonald, you think, is going to have a significant say in what they do. Now, you presume Geno Smith's going to be back. I don't know. Um, maybe the Seattle Seahawks are one of those teams that decides we got a new head coach. We've got a new offensive coordinator. We're going to maybe try to draft a quarterback. Maybe maybe they go get Michael Penix. Who knows? Um it's hard for me to sit here and tell you what Ryan Grubb is going to do. I really want to see what they do this offseason. Are they going to kind of roll it back with the, the skill position players they have? Or are they going to make some interesting moves to to try to p- put this team in Mike McDonald's uh, kind of kind of uh, vision? What about Liam Cohen with the Bucks? Not a not a not a real large sample size there, Joe. Another guy kind of coming from college. He did have the one year. With the Rams, he's a, he's a but he guy. wasn't calling the plays. Yeah, he's a McVay guy. Um, so, what what you anticipate is, does he do some of this, like, first and foremost, we know McVay likes to have kind of that bell cow back. It just depends on who it is. I think Liam Cohen going to the Buccaneers is a good sign for Rashad White. I thought that offensive line improved by the end of the year, although they were far better as a pass protection unit. Um and then the slot receiver is going to be a very important part of what they do in Tampa Bay. Um, I think this is probably good news for Chris Godwin. But again, as you mentioned, not a play caller. So he's somebody who we probably want to see what they do in the offseason a little bit. But I would consider that very good news for Rashad White that he's there uh, in that in that uh, offense. That's interesting. So when you think McVay, the first two things you think about are running back and slot receiver. Yeah. Yeah, and like, you know, not that Cooper Cup doesn't get move inside outside, but you know, Chris Godwin can do that. So, um, you know, Mike Evans is not under contract. Uh so I, I'm really interested to see who's going to be kind of that slot receiver in this offense. Not to say he's gonna be Cooper Cup, uh, but Chris Godwin could have a could have a nice little season here with Liam Cohen as the offensive coordinator. Last one I wanted to ask you about today is probably Greg Roman. Okay. Yeah. And we might have talked about this last week when I was at the Super Bowl briefly or um, even going back to maybe I mentioned with Evan Silva the week you were at the Senior Bowl. The Greg Roman thing is really interesting to me because when I think of him, I think a lot of the quarterback run game with Kaepernick in San Francisco, with Lamar in Baltimore. And so him being with the Chargers, with Herbert, that's – although you know what? Herbert did run pretty well at Oregon, didn't he? Sometimes. Yeah, he can run a little bit more. Um, Ross, your thought process here is completely right. Listen to these numbers for Greg Roman. Greg Roman has been an offensive coordinator for three different teams for 10 seasons in the NFL. San Francisco, Buffalo, and Baltimore. His team have never ranked outside of the top 10 in rushing yards or rushing attempts in a season. Never. As a matter of fact, his teams have finished first in rushing yards four times. That was four consecutive years, two with Buffalo and two with Baltimore. Now, obviously, they had Tyrod Taylor. They had uh, they had Lamar Jackson, okay? That's clearly going to affect your rushing offense. His teams have finished outside the top 25 in pass attempts in nine of his 10 seasons as a, as an offensive coordinator in the NFL, not outside of the top 25 Ross only once was, was even in the top half of the league. That was his second to last year in Baltimore with Lamar Jackson. When they finished 13th, the, 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 remember the off season talk was, Oh, you know, they're going to open up the offense for Lamar coming off of, um, coming off of 2020, and it turns out that they ended up being a bottom five team in terms of interceptions thrown. So Greg Roman's offenses have never had had good passes. Their passing games have been basically designed to take care of the football. Um, when he was under Harbaugh in San Francisco, here were his teams in terms of pass attempts. 29th, 23rd, 30th, and 30th under Harbaugh. Here were his the, his teams under Harbaugh in terms of interceptions thrown. Fewest, 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 fifth fewest. That was the philosophy of Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman. And wow. if you look and if you look at Mi- Michigan, that was a ball control offense. Our guy Brett Whitefield at Fantasy Points has JJ McCarthy as his number one quarterback in this class, which nobody else does. 
because you look at him and you're like, oh, he's a game manager, you know, like they just ran the football. But that's what Jim Harbaugh wanted to do. This is the single most fascinating coaching hire to me because Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh's philosophy does not line up with the public perception of Justin Herbert. Now, I think they're good coaches. I think they're going to adapt. But this could be a fascinating thing to watch this offseason. Absolutely love it, Joe. Great work. Other than that, I'm stuffed. We're done. Thanks for tuning in to Fantasy Feast. Make sure to also check out the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, Even Money, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. (laughs) 